Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. I hope you're doing well. My name's Dave Marshall and this is episode 103 on terror birds with Dino de Grange of CONICET, the National Research Council of Argentina. So, Liz, this is an interview that you did. How did it all come about? Yeah, this interview kind of came about because a few years ago, a listener had suggested they wanted to hear an episode on terror birds. And I've been thinking about it ever since. And then I was at the International Congress of Vertebrate Morphology in Prague in July and discovered that Dino was giving a talk on terror birds and thought, well, this is perfect. Let's sit down and have a chat. So fortunately, Dino was willing and that's kind of how that worked. Yeah, so if you do make recommendations, we do eventually get around to them. I mean, we do about 24 episodes a year, like two a month, if you're new to the show. Uh, And if you do make your recommendation, it will plant a seed, let's just say, and we'll eventually get to it. We try our best. Sometimes (laughs) it takes a while, but we do try. So I actually met Dino at work, and that was after you'd recorded this interview. But I didn't know that it, that you guys had recorded this. I, I knew that you'd done an interview on birds, but I didn't know what it was about or who it was with. And then I met Dino, and we spent uh, a couple of days actually working together. And I'd mentioned that I had... Um, that ran this podcast and he didn't make the connection that that was the podcast that he'd just been interviewed for and I suggested to him that I actually have him on the show and he's like yeah that sounds great we'll do it one day neither of us realizing that he'd already done it so (laughs) he's a great guy he's uh really interesting to talk to and that's why I asked him hey hey come on the show you'd be you'd be brilliant but uh, I don't know what he was doing, just uh, agreeing to do all of the podcasts that he's heard about. So I think he just wants to talk about terror birds with whoever will talk to him about it. So he's just happy. And I'm sure all of our audience are going to want to tell everyone all about terror birds. There's so much in this interview uh, when I was editing it that I was just like, wow, that is really interesting. There's, there's so many little the factoids that are going to stick with me. It was, it was one that I really did enjoy. Mm, I think it's something really interesting because terror birds are such weird animals and yet we don't really hear anything about them. They're, they hardly exist in you know any TV, media, anything like that. And yeah, everything Dino said, I was just like, really? What? Seriously? <laughs> cool. Yeah, so it was one of my interviews of the year, and uh, speaking of years, uh, we've been going now for seven, we've just had our seventh birthday, so we're getting pretty long in the tooth, Liz. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's been a while, but happy birthday to us. Happy birthday, woo! (laughs) Give us some money. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, help us keep doing this. A birthday present, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? What uh. what would be your PaleoCast birthday present to yourself? It could be a piece of equipment, it could be a recording in the field, it could be uh, an interview that you've always wanted to get. What would you give yourself? I would say probably recording either in the field or going to a conference, like a designated get to go and do a bunch of interviews with people that I don't normally get to do that or have the time to do that otherwise. So you're talking maybe SVP in yes. Brisbane yeah. this year? Yeah, so I'm, well, I'm already going to SVP, but unfortunately have to pay for it myself. Oh. Um, but, you know, going to something like Palace or SVP next year or some kind of big conference where you can just go and get a bunch of interviews because you're not worrying about doing anything else and running around. Yeah, sure. So have a look at the conferences that are out. Uh, Audience, if you see anyone that you want us to interview, maybe we can arrange that whilst we're at a conference. And hopefully this year uh, we should be at uh, Palace, which is in Valencia. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mm -hmm. we should be live streaming all of that. So that's all in place. So long as I'm not off on an oil rig somewhere, (laughs) which may be the case. Fingers crossed. I mean, it's good if you're on an oil rig, but then also good if you're, you know, recording PaleoCast. Yeah, I think I know which one I'd rather be doing. (laughs) What about you, Dave? What would your PaleoCast birthday present be? 
It would always have to be something really nerdy and gadgety. I've been I've been looking at um, a whole load of different live streaming mixing desks and lights and stuff like that. So, ah, oh, some some good video stuff. We'd like some yeah. video stuff, wouldn't we? Yeah. Anyway, nice. that's that's enough waffling. Uh, everyone is waiting for Dino's interview, so we should uh, just jump straight into that. Uh, but before we do, just the usual request that if you do enjoy this episode, please share it everywhere you absolutely can and give us a like, give us a review on Facebook and on iTunes. It all really, really helps. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, could you start out by kind of introducing yourself and telling us how you got into Terrorbirds and what you're doing? Well, um, I'm Federico de Grange, but everybody knows me as Dino. I'm a researcher with a stable position as a researcher for CONICET in my country, Argentina. Um, my institution is the CICTERRA, Centro de Investigaciones en Ciencias de la Tierra, <laughs> in Córdoba province which is a really nice province. Mm -hmm. And actually I started um, doing my PhD in La Plata City, in the museum. Mm -hmm. um, and funnily, funnily actually, uh, I wanted to do my PhD on uh, Mesozoic birds, okay. uh, because I love them at the moment. But my advisor, uh, who was my advisor, but, uh, who was my advisor, sorry, at that time, um, Claudia Tambusi, she told me something like, I, I don't know nothing about Mesozoic birds, but I have this group that nobody has studied um, through a morph uh, morphofunctional perspective. So that's how I, my love story with the terror bird started. Uh, and I, I have to say that I totally fell in love with, the, with those outstanding animals uh, <laughs> I have even a tattoo of a, a terror bear, so yeah, I'm quite a fanatic of terror bears now. Cool. It's, it's funny, I guess, you know, a lot of people come out saying, I always wanted to do this, and then that's what I ended up doing. So it's cool that you kind of started wanting to do something else, but then yeah. did that instead and still love oh, it. There, there is a lot of things that usually as a student we don't know, and yeah. once you get to the real work, there is like, hey, you have all this actually to do, and yeah. that's how you discover good things, like terror birds. Yeah. So, what exactly is a terror bird? That is actually a, an excellent question. <laughs> um, a terror bird is a group of birds that are, are totally extinct, that actually have uh, several osteological features that are really weird. They have like a a reduced coracoid. Um, they have really, really narrow pelvis. They have elongated hind limbs, reduced fore, fore, fore limbs, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but the main feature that actually tell us what is a terror bird is the skull. Okay. The skull of a terror bird is it's really characteristic. They have long, tall, narrow, hollow beaks. Um, which is exclusive for a neo neognath bird. Uh, but what is actually really exclusive about a terror bird is that terror bird is the only truly akinetic neognath bird. They have, uh, contrary to the rest of the neognath, terror birds cannot uh, bend uh, the upper jaw oh, against the uh, regarding the, the neurocranium. This is because they suffer early in their history the fusion of the palatal bending zones, uh, pa palatines, uh, ma maxillary bones, and sugar arcs are highly fused, fused between each other. So, and in larger turbers, are act that feature is actually more accentuated because those uh, areas get even thicker. And also, larger turbers also lose uh, the craniofacial hinge, 
which is retained in primitive terror birds. But still, no, non terror birds can do uh, uh, kinetic movements. Huh. So. That's really interesting. So, how big would these skulls have been? Uh, smallest terror birds, for example, have a skull of 25, 20, 25 centimeters long. Okay. Uh, larger terror birds, the largest terror bird uh, skull that is known, is actually also the largest bird skull known in the yeah. world, and it's 71 centimeters long. Wow, and that it's from Kelenken. Yeah, and they're completely not moving, like no. completely akinetic. Yes. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, you mentioned things like a reduced coracoid. Does that mean they weren't flying? <laughs> yes and no. Um, we know that largest terror birds, uh, and when I say largest, I mean birds of about uh, 1 meter, 40, 50 centimeters tall, okay. and between, uh, it, sorry, it, it, when I say large, I mean between, uh, I, I say actually medium to large size for forest racids. This is a, a bird of about uh, one meter forty tall, two almost three meters tall, and okay. and uh, a body mass of about 40, 40 kilograms to almost two hundred kilograms. Wow! Smallest terror birds actually, Silopterines were like five kilograms, ten kilograms, and they were ninety centimeters tall. We don't have actually full evidence of of at least the smallest terror birds that, that it is known, that it's Silopterus bachmani from the Santa Crucian. Mm -hmm. uh, we, don't ha we don't have fully evidence that that animal wasn't able to fly. And actually, uh, four limb proportions actua actually tell us that they probably could at least flap. Okay. Um, so we think that they could... Uh, I, I think that actually smallest terror birds Silopterus, basically, maybe they could, let's say, fly, but it's like in a clumsy way. Okay. Like um, turbers, for example, are are, are related with seriemas, with extant seriemas. Cariamide is the family, okay. uh, which live in South America. Um, and those animals, for example, they are not good flyers. That they, they they can fly. They actually nest in trees, uh, but they they. They tend to run and they fly like uh, just a little, or, or as I say, like in a clumsy manner. You know, like tinamus, like they do, like just yeah, and fly. <laughs> so uh, you cannot see this. Uh, it's a like they, they just they, 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 yeah. <laughs> so they, they just uh, flap like a lot uh, and yeah. fast, just trying to. Uh, and Sariemas actually fly, especially just to get to the nest, to get. Um, to jump into prey or to escape uh, from okay. predators. So, but in, in general, they don't fly. So probably terror, smaller terror birds um, didn't do the same. Okay. And did they lose flight? Like, would a would terror bird ancestors have been able to fly, and then they eventually lost it? Yes. Uh, we know that the derived terror birds are totally flightless. Okay. Uh, but we know that we don't, at least uh, from from the primitive features of the wing and coracoid that we observe in Silopterus, which is supposed to belong to, to the more primitive group of terror birds. We know that, that uh, flightless is the derived condition among terror birds and, and, and uh, being poorly flight, it's the, the primitive condition for the group. Funny thing is that actually terror birds lose the flight apparently two times. Uh, yeah, because actually the, we have basically two groups of terror birds, uh, and that it's based on ha of on pelvis morphology and skull morphology. Uh, I like to call them Silopterin type and terror bird type. Um, I know that this may sound confusing, but uh, the reason for that names is that actually not all Forus racids, which is the family Forus racide, are terror birds. The terror bird is a concept that Marshall, uh, uh, Larry Marshall, created in 1978 based on Andalgalornis because it's an animal that actually looks like real fierce and yeah. tough. 
but when you see a xylopterin, it actually doesn't resemble that much to a like a violent, uh, aggressive bird. So it's not common for us, I mean, South American people or Argentinian people, to actually think uh, on uh, as a as a for a xylopterin as a terror bird. Nevertheless, I know that popularly it's used for for all the the, the for all the forest rassets, um, yes. because it's more common to call them that that way. Yeah. Well, but but what I was saying is that uh, since xylop xylopterin type, which is the includes the more primitive uh, group uh, of of terror birds, uh, you have from those probably one group arise, and it is called uh, mesembryornithin which is a, also a highly derived group of terror birds. They lost, they lose their flight, their, their flight. And independently, there is another group, the terror bird group, which includes Forus racine, Patagornitine, and Fisornitine, which also are totally flightless. So that's an, ev an evidence that actually flight was lost two times independently. Uh, uh, something else that was inde achieved independently was the larger body mass. Mesembryornitin also reached larger body masses. And the other group, Fisornitine, Patagornitine, and Forosracine, also achieve larger, larger two giant, actually, body masses. So lots of different features are evolving at several different yes. times throughout the lineage. Yes. So that's really interesting. You keep mentioning sort of South America and Argentina. Is this the only place that terror birds are found, or do we have them outside of South America? No, we have... Uh, they, are, they were mo mostly found in Argentina. We have records from Uruguay, Brazil, uh, United States, in Florida and Texas. And, <clears throat> but uh, there are also some controversial remains from Africa and Europe, which personally I don't think that they are terror birds. They probably belong to uh, some stem group of Kariami forms. Uh, terror birds are actually cariamiforms. It's a derived group of cariamiforms. So probably in Europe and and Africa and and the and in the Eocene of North America we have the the stem group of cariamiforms. And probably some of those uh, groups are key to understand how terror birds actually appeared and evolved. At what point in time were terror birds living? The oldest record of a terror bird, of a confirmed terror bird, is from Lower Eocene. Okay. How uh, many million years? Fifty. Okay. Um, and the the youngest record, it's for sure, uh, it's um, uh, Lower Pleistocene, so one oh. point. Uh, 1.8 million years. There are some there are also controversial records from Uruguay that actually are dated in about between 17,000 okay. and 10,000. Uh, wow. Uh, but the debate about th those remains is high, so yeah. I, I prefer to be conservative at the moment and yeah. say that for sure they are until the the, the lower Pleistocene. Is that debate because they're not terror birds or debate because the aging or like timing is... Actually both because um, the debate is based because it's due to fragment, the fragmentary nature of the materials as assigned to terror bird uh, from Uruguay and there were also some problems about the dating from the formation and also there is another more like I don't know if the word is cultural but let's say cultural some of them remains are were actually collected many many years ago they were just throw away in a museum and yeah. with with just saying something like it was in the base on the of the hill yeah. over there so uh, we actually don't know exactly where from where they come. So. Okay, that makes sense. You've mentioned a little bit about fragmentary remains and obviously skulls, but do we know the whole skeletons of these animals? We don't know the the whole skeleton, okay. but the we have we ha we were really lucky in 2015. We published the most complete skeleton of a terror bird called Shashawabis kagliai. 
uh, it is a mesembryonic team from the middle Pliocene of Buenos Aires province and its skeleton is about 85% complete. Oh, wow. So the only thing that they are missing are the manus yeah. and some fingers in the toe of the toe. Ah, uh, of the, yeah, of the toe, of the feet. Yeah. Sorry. That's pretty good. Um, do you have, from other specimens, do we ha like have the whole skeleton known, you know, even if not from yeah. a single specimen? Yeah, but yeah, um, almost. Yeah. Uh, Cylopterus uh, lemoine, which is also from the Santa Crucian. We have like, from, if we put all the specimens together, we have like probably uh, 85, 90%. That's really cool. I always sort of assume, you know, bird fossils are not fantastically well preserved often and you get groups where you have maybe 20% yeah. of it known. So it's nice that you have actually mm -hmm. most of it for a couple of different species too. Yeah, l luckily for us, turtle birds are, uh, have more uh, uh, dense bones, so they tend to, at least as, as far as we know, preserve better. Yeah. So. We have much species that are actually very well uh, represented by high limb, uh, fore limbs, part, partial skulls. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I work a lot on pneumaticity, so I'm going to guess that their bones are not pneumatized. No, they are <laughs> highly pneumatized actually. Ah, it, like postcranial or just both. Skull. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I'm going to have to ask you more questions about that. <laughs> okay. <later. laughs> um, Looking at kind of the skull that you were talking about before and how it doesn't move, are they really powerful? What would they have been kind of doing with these skulls? Um, what we published actually in 2010 using a finite element analysis in, in one species, Andalgalornis, uh, we discovered that actually terror bear have weak bone, weak, uh, big, sorry, uh, regarding lateral movements, so they actually cannot bite. We think that they act, they they cannot actually bite and shake laterally a prey. Okay. So, uh, based on what we found, we hypothesized that the best way for a terror bird to kill a prey was actually using hatchet-like uh, strikes. Okay. So really directed really well directed and precise dorsal ventral movements and then once once the prey was uh, down uh, using pullback um, okay. forces just to tear the prey apart yeah. uh, the good thing about that is that actually two years later we publish also uh, the neck muscle and ligamentary system uh, of of andal galornis also so and we discovered that they have really powerful neck bone and neck uh, muscles, and they have a really, um, let's say, economic uh, a ligamentary system. So the recovery of to the posi to the position of of the neck being backward yeah. uh, was really fast. Huh. So basically, m most muscles were the more most uh, j uh, neck muscles were dedicated to uh, do a, a, a yeah snapping and a. And a a strong and fast strike, but the ligamentary system was like fastened, taking right. the neck ba back. So they could keep doing it yes. really quickly. Yes, and actually something that Serie must do. Ah, interesting. Would they have been actively pursuing their prey? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, well, something that I found during my PhD was actually Terrebert have uh, elongated hind limbs, okay. especially some groups, they have really elongated tarsus metatarsus which is somehow indicating uh, ra running ability, cursorial abilities. Uh, but what is actually really telling us uh, the ability, the cursorial abilities of, of Thurbert is actually the length of the pelvis. The postacetabular length, uh, it's actually quite long. And that is because uh, you have the, the, the extensor muscles of the hind limb uh, originating there, so a, a bird that that occurs in two kind of birds basically, running runners and swimming swimmers. That's okay. because they need strong uh, and rapid uh, muscle movements that take the femur and tibiotarsus backward. Okay. And but also what terror birds have 
it's a really unique structure in the pelvis. Um, they have a really developed laterally uh, antitrochanter. The, the antitrochanter, basically what it does is to, it's keeping the femur directed forwards, avoiding lateral uh, torsion. Yeah. So that it's and that it's uh, optimized in in birds that needs to run because the movement of the femur is just uh, um, to the front. Yeah. You know, it's like dorsoventral, but just front, and it doesn't have lateral flexion. So that maximizes the running. Yeah. And are these features things that are known for all terror birds, or is this something like would there would there have been a lot of variation? Between? No, no, it's known in all terror okay. birds. And that's. So they'd all have that same sort of active prey. Yes, as, as far as we know, yeah. Cool. Probably larger or gigantic turnovers since they were like really large. Yeah. They were not as fast, yeah. but they, at least as far as we know, they probably were good runners. Yeah. Like um, Amoa, for example. Is there any studies or any evidence of what their wings or lack thereof of wings would have been used for? Could they have done anything with? No, no, actually no, and that's something that we are working on. Um, okay. We know that that uh, smaller terror birds, Psylopterin, could probably flap, yeah. but how they, they use the, that flapping, uh, apart from probably a clumsy flying, we actually don't know. Okay. Uh, Probably it's um, probably larger turbers who actually has really uh, uh, reduced, uh, complete but reduced uh, uh, forelimbs. Maybe I can think about stabilization during running, yeah. but it's yeah. uh, it's highly hypothetical at this moment actually. Yeah. So they have complete wings. They're just reduced. yes, just reduced. Oh, yes. That's interesting. I think things like ratites, like in emus or in ostriches, they'll sometimes use them for displays or yes. like scaring away. Yes. Could that be something? Mm, I don't think so, because actually yeah, when you think about, for example, uh, uh, an ostrich or um, or um, uh, rea, yeah. they actually have large uh, Four limbs, okay. like really large, but they don't have the keel, for example. Terrorbirds right. actually have the keel okay. in the sternum, um, and actually they have a large keel. Yeah. Um, so they still have quite well developed muscles. Yes, but pectoral just, muscle. Yes. That's interesting. Yes. Um, you've also done kind of moving away from the locomotion side. You've also done some work on like sensory capabilities. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you've done? Yes. Um, uh, we have a, a project um, to study the sensory capabilities of terror birds together with uh, Claudia Tambusi and Larry Whitmer and Don Serio and, and uh, Ryan Ridgely. Um, what we have found, uh, uh, and some, some of this is published, uh, it's regarding the inner ear, for example, we know that the semicircular canals are really are, are, are thin and elongated, so that is telling us that something like, something about the agility of a bird, we are looking at the ear of a very agile uh, okay. bird. We also know the, the hearing capabilities of terror birds, and we know that they can hear lower range, lower range uh, frequencies. So basically that means that they could also produce that kind of sound. Um, and um, what we are still trying to figure out is if, if that, that kind of sounds were produced to communicate between, between each other or to prey detection or something like that. Um, but the brain of the turbers actually it's like, uh, like really interesting. They have several features of a real highly visual uh, bird. So okay. probably terror birds, uh, at the moment what we think is that that uh, bird, uh, the, sorry, terror bird brain actually evolved as a, as a response uh, to the 
the new envir environment that they conquer. That this is the niche of being a, a cursorial predator, which is actually exclusive for terror birds. There is none. Uh, uh, the most, the only thing that is similar is seriemas, but it's nothing alike. So terror birds are actually the only group of birds that are actually cursorial predators that they chase like yeah. they need to chase a prey to kill kill it and 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 eat them uh, so probably as a response of that they develop this highly visual system they have really enlarged rules um, which is which uh, is a, an area in in the dorsal part of the telencephalon they have uh, also a really enlarged um, uh, optic lobes and that together with the inner ear tell us that they have a, a system that is optimized for gaze stabilization which is essential when you are trying to chase something that it's probably moving yeah and you have to keep your eyes on that and if the prey turns you have to turn fast and see again the the, yeah. the and this is all based on kind of shape and structures of the brain. Yes, yes. And also what we know now, it's something else that we are doing with, with Don and Larry, is uh, we have calculated the visual fields of terror birds and we know that that they are able to see the beak or the tip of the beak, which is essential for a for a predator. Yeah. So they have would they have proper sort of stereoscopic vision. Mm-hmm. Huh, that's cool. Uh, going back to what you said about hearing and yes. frequency, how do you figure that out from fossils? What kind uh, of frequency they can hear? Because <laughs> I've never heard of that uh, It's uh, It's based on a method that uh, Walsh and collaborators published. Um, basically, Stig Walsh. Stig Walsh, yeah. yeah. Um, basically, what you have to do is uh, do a 3D, uh, 3D model of the inner ear and um, that is also possible because as in the brain the the, the inner ear it's uh, totally enclosed uh, by bones so they left like a cavity that reflects perfectly the, the inner ear morphology yeah. including the cochlea and so if you know the length of the cochlea the length of the cochlea it's highly correlated with the uh, uh, bas uh, basilar papilla and bas or basilar organ, yeah. which is the main um, frequency receptor in the nervous system. Uh, so once you know the, the length of the cochlea based on regressions that uh, Stig and collaborators published, you can st estimate the mean hearing and the hearing range. Yeah. And that means that you have fossils that are well enough preserved that you can actually get these very yes. fine structures. Yes. That's pretty cool. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at some skull stuff right now and I can't see anything uh, at all because it's completely crushed. So it's nice that you've got... Does that mean that they're all 3D as well? Or? Yeah, in general, yeah. Yeah, yeah. nice. Um, no, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, now I have to figure out where... Um, so I guess kind of moving on from anatomy, we talked a little bit about their evolution and where they kind of came from, but what about extinction? Do we know why they went extinct? We or? actually don't know yet why they got they got extinct. Uh, it's something that I'm still working and, and thinking about. Uh, my best hypothesis now is that actually terror birds uh, anatomical evidence suggests us, and, and, bi and biomechanical evidence also suggests that terror birds actually got too specialized oh. in the way they, they live uh, and they hunt and they chase. Yeah. Um, in, so uh, during the period that terror birds live in, my, in, in, in South America, sorry, yeah. um, most of their preys probably were na native ungulates. Uh, but when the, the Panama Isthmus emerged, a lot of North American ungulate mammals yeah. uh, uh, migrate to South America. And that, that actually produced some competition between those species. And apparently, uh, 
uh, not ungulated were start to declining before that, okay. but when the competition got harder, they, 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 the extinction of the, on the not ungulates uh, went faster yeah. and quicker. So probably at the, at the same time, uh, terror birds actually have to compete with, uh, with the fact actually that their, their prey actually they were going to they were going extinct. Yeah. They have to start chasing prey that were winning their competition with the other mammals, yeah. and actually they have probably to compete with other. Uh, uh, Eutherian uh, predators, yeah. um, sm pro smaller predators like pros prosionids or those kind of animals that actually prey on, prey on different things, but they probably make the the, the food resource uh, more scarce. So, yeah, that makes sense. I guess when suddenly you have this big influx of other animals, and then you can't. Catch yeah. Them, so. Yeah. So basically, terror birds. It what what, we, what I think is that terror birds got too specialized that it was too er, too late to be to know how to be a general generalist. Yeah. And uh, so, would they have had any uh, predators themselves? We don't know. Okay. We don't know. Probably. Yeah. Uh, probably. Uh, they live. They live. Um, for example, in Santa Cruz, which is the which is the place where uh, the, the stage, sorry, where the terror birds are best best known, they live with a lot of marsupial predator that they were small, medium, and large size. So probably one some of some of those um, predate on some terror birds. I mean, a small terror bird, it was fast, but it was not highly dangerous for a large mammal predator. Probably a Borienid, for example, wouldn't try to kill a Forus racos because yeah. it was an animal of two meters five tall, so yeah. uh, 50 tall, sorry. Yeah. Two meters 50 tall. So yeah. I keep coming up with random questions <laughs> and no. something I hadn't thought about before, but do we know anything about their ontogeny? Or no, nothing. So there's no eggs or juveniles? Mm, or there, there is just one juvenile, but it's heavily crushed, so oh. we don't know. We don't know much. Oh, that's really interesting. Normally there's something and, you know, you get a lot of bird egg no, material, no. but... It's funny because we know... Uh, it's somehow funny because we <laughs> actually know the tongue bones of terror birds. Yeah. We know this, the, the, the trachea and the cricoid uh, cartilage, which are ossified in terror birds. We know those, yeah. but we don't know anything about eggs or, or mm. chicks or... Just one heavily crushed, uh, huh. poorly represented by bones uh, juvenile. Yeah. Well, hopefully one day you'll yeah, find yeah, yeah. a nice series or yeah. at least a baby or something. I'm looking for it. <laughs> so I guess that's kind of a good place to come to my next question, which maybe other than looking at ontogeny, what do you think is the next sort of big interesting thing about terror birds to look at? Well, um, one is actually ontogeny. We, it will be really good no, to know actually how the, the beak, uh, that strange structure that they have, evolved. Uh, and the other thing is actually we still don't have, uh, we don't still know for sure how terror birds originated, how okay. they evolved, how was, the, how were the first uh, stages of their evolution. So yeah. my probably my biggest question now is to know that it's uh, are there any transitional no puzzles? we don't know okay. we don't know any transitional form okay. that 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 is why probably that that's that's the biggest question yeah uh, but still there are a lot of field works in terrors that we don't know we want we want to keep working on on wing structure uh, neck muscles there are also different types of necks among terror birds yeah uh, longer and shorter, uh, sturdier and slender. Yeah. Uh, so we want to also know that. Uh, it's something that, for example, it's this is going to sound funny and weird, but something that it's really called my attention, that it's, for example, um, uh, 
Patagornis and Andalgalornis have like a really, really narrow pelvis. So I'm all, all the time that I'm looking at that, it's like, okay, where are the kidneys here? Yeah. So we don't know. <laughs> it's it's really, it, in, huh. in, in some smaller turnovers, there, you can find the, this is just curiosity. I don't know yeah. if it's the biggest question, but it's sure. some, something that it will be good to know actually. Because since pterobers have this all this weird structure, there are a lot of soft tissue reconstruct soft, soft tissue reconstruction that actually it's highly challenging. Oh, that's really interesting. Well, thank you very much for talking with me. Again, thank you for inviting me. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast, and like us at facebook.com forward slash paleocast to get all the latest news.